In today's video, we're going back to my home turf of behavioral science to talk about one of the worst pee hackers in history. His name? Brian Wanzink, a Cornell professor who was widely regarded as one of the world's leading experts in the science of eating. But as you'll see, his arrogance is going to get the better of him, and he ends up outing himself as an extreme pee hacker. So this is a cautionary tale of how one of the world's leading food scientists ended up in the soup. My name is Brian Wansink and I'm a professor of consumer behavior and nutritional science. Kind of a food psychologist and I study why people do what they do when it comes to food. Brian Wansink stopped blogging in March 2017. 45 of Wansink's published articles are alleged to contain problems. Oh, you want to hear my favorite impression of you? Now, Brian Wanzink is often used as a classic example of how bad science happens, which is also the title of a book that I'm reading on Shortform, who are kindly sponsoring today's video. Shortform is actually the first brand that I ever worked with on this channel, and I'm delighted to continue my partnership with them because I genuinely love their service. If you don't know who they are, Shortform are a service that provides summaries of non-fiction books. They have lots of different genres like business, economics, and psychology. And right now, like I said, I'm reading a book called Bad Science by a guy called Ben Goldacre. Ben Goldacre was an Oxford professor who, like me, got fed up of bad science, poor studies being carried out, and even poorer reporting of those studies. Thanks to Shortform's great summary of this book, I was easily able to see that there are three key parts to this bad science problem. The first is poor methods, the second is poor claims, and finally there's the poor reporting of those claims by mainstream media. This was all laid out in a clear way thanks to Shortform's summary, so if you want to get great summaries of non-fiction books like this one, then be sure to use my link in the description and you'll get a five-day free trial for Shortform. Thank you, Shortform, for sponsoring today's video. Let's get back to talking about Brian Wanzink. So our story actually starts in 2013 with this lady. Her name is Özge Searcher. At least I think that's how you pronounce her name. She's a young researcher from Turkey who, like me, loved behavioral science. And so she applies to work at one of the world's leading behavioral science labs, which is the Food and Brand Lab at Cornell, run by none other than Brian Wanzink. Now, it's no surprise that Erzke had heard of Brian Wanzink and his lab. After all, Brian Wanzink was regularly featured on major publications like the Today Show, the New York Times, and even Oprah. I hope they cancel Oprah. Take that back. Not only that, but his research was also used as the basis for some major public policy interventions. For example, the Smarter Lunchrooms initiative, which was started by the Obama administration with the intention of using behavioral science to nudge school children to make healthier choices. One of Brian Wanzig's papers that was used as the basis for this program was one that showed that if you put Elmo stickers on apples, children are more likely to choose them over cookies when presented with that choice. But unfortunately, this program was based off flawed research. And to find out how it happened, we need to go go back to the story of Özge. So Özge gets into Brian's lab, which I'm sure was a massive break for her. It'd be a massive break for any behavioral scientist, but especially as somebody from Turkey, where I know the opportunities to work in behavioral science are much fewer and further between, I'm sure this was a very exciting opportunity for her. But in the weeks leading up to her joining Brian's lab, she's given a very weird assignment from Brian. You see, the way that science is supposed to work is that we first come up with a hypothesis for what we want to test, and then we gather data to validate or disprove that hypothesis. But what Brian does with Erzga is just simply hand her a data set to analyze. Now the data set in question is very interesting, and it's interesting because it actually came from one of Brian Wanzink's failed experiments. It was an experiment that took place at an Italian buffet, and the way that it worked was that patrons who entered the buffet had to either pay $8 or $4 for the buffet. And then after they finished their meal, they had to fill out a survey talking about how satisfied they were with their meal, along with some demographic information about themselves. And what Brian was trying to show was that there is a clear relationship between how much people pay for their meal and how satisfied they feel with their meal at the end. But like I said, this was a failed study. Wanzig's initial analysis of this data set proved that there was no clear relationship between how much people pay and how satisfied they feel. Now a failed experiment is nothing unusual in science. In fact, that's a key part of the scientific process. But rather than put this data set in the file drawer, which is what most scientists unfortunately are forced to do these days, or even better, try to publish his null result, instead Brian insists that there must be some kind kind of relationship to be found somewhere in this data set. And it was up to Özge to find that relationship. Now, unbelievably, the reason why we know this is because of a series of leaked emails between Brian and Özge. So this is the email. It says, hi Özge, glad you had a chance to take an initial look at the data. 
I don't think I've ever done an interesting study where the data came out the first time I looked at it. I would like you to really dig into this to find a number of situations or people for which this relationship does hold. First, look to see if there are any weird outliers. If there seems to be a reason they are different, pull them out, but especially note why you did so, so you can describe it in the method. Secondly, think of all the different ways you could cut the data and analyze subsets of it to see when this relationship holds. Now, chopping up your data like this is textbook p-hacking and is very problematic in science, especially in psychology. This kind of practice is one of the main reasons that we have so many false positives in psychology and so many things don't replicate. But poor young Özgür from Turkey, who was completely unpaid by the way, was not about to refuse the famous Brian Wanzink when he made such a request. So she did exactly as she was told. She cut up the data and went back to Brian week after week with different ways of chopping up the data until she found some relationships that held. And this practice turned out to be remarkably productive for her. In fact, at the end of her six month stint at Brian Wanzig's lab, she had already had one paper published and two papers with revision requests and two others that were submitted and then eventually accepted. Wow. Great for Özgür and great for Brian Wanzink. Now you might be wondering how I know about all of these very specific details of Özgür's time at Brian Wanzink's lab. And that's because Brian Wanzig wrote about it on his own blog. So what you can see on screen now is Brian Wanzink's blog and more specifically, Brian Wanzink's last ever blog post because it was this blog post where he talked about his interactions with Özgür that ended up bringing down his whole career. But Brian also compares his time with Özgür to another paid postdoc who worked at his lab. So what Brian says in his blog is that actually he offered the buffet data to the postdoc first before offering it to Özgür. But the postdoc turned him down and didn't want to do the analysis that he suggested on that data set. And in the blog, Brian ends up praising Özgür for her remarkable productivity and for willingly engaging in this kind of behavior and chastises the postdoc for refusing to do p-hacking. And as you can imagine, this blog post caused her quite the storm for Brian Wanzink. Some of the immediate comments directly on the blog post are absolutely hilarious. So let me read a few of them to you. The first one says, Brian, is this a tongue-in-cheek satire of the academic process or are you serious? I hope it's the former. Another one says, you pushing an unpaid PhD student into salami slicing null results into five p-hacked papers and you shame a paid postdoc for saying no to doing the same? I really hope this story is a joke. If not, your behavior is one of the biggest causes of the proliferation of junk science and psychology and you are the one who should be shamed not the postdoc. So after this major backlash to the blog post, Brian Wanzink initially tries to defend himself and justify his behavior, but there really is no way to defend this kind of scientific practice. So shortly afterwards, he takes this blog post down and never posts another blog post again. But it was too late. It was already on the internet and now this blog post lives on in the internet archives. After this blog post came out and for many years to come afterwards, people would pore over Brian Wanzink's research and critically evaluate it looking for anomalies and errors and all kinds of evidence of p-hacking. In fact, critics of Brian Wanzink's work even banded together to form the Wanzink dossier, which was a whole compilation of all of Brian Wanzink's failed papers. To date, according to Retraction Watch, Brian Wanzink has had 18 papers retracted, including all of those ones that he did with Özgür on the Italian buffet. And one of his other papers was actually retracted twice. Can you guess which one I'm talking about? That's right, the one about putting Elmo stickers on the apples and to explain how a paper can be retracted twice. Apparently the first time it was retracted was because Brian Wanzink wasn't satisfied with the p-value that ended up coming out. You see, the academic standard for statistical significance is p less than 0.05. To be honest, it's a bit of an arbitrary figure, but somehow that has become the industry standard for how we test for statistical significance. Now, Brian wasn't totally happy with this Elmo study because the p-value was 0.06, just shy of that magic 0.05 mark that everybody looks for. And so through another leaked email, we can see more evidence of Brian's p-hacking. Here's the email, it says, hi David, here's the Elmo study we are going to spin off and submit. I think we can start with, he names a couple of journals and he'll give Sandra a list of other journals that he wants to submit to. But the really interesting part is the second paragraph where he says, one sticking point is that although the stickers increase apple selection by 71%, for some reason this is a p-value of 0.06. It seems to me it should be lower. If you can get the data and it needs some tweaking, it would be good to get that one value below 0.05. Now apparently the first time that this study was published, it appeared in JAMA, a pretty well-known journal, with the 0.06 p-value intact. 
but shortly afterwards it was retracted and then replaced with a new p-value of 0.02 somehow. But then, a little while later, the same paper gets retracted again because in the methodology they said that the study was done on kids aged between 8 to 11, when in fact the study was done on 3 to 5 year olds. What an absolute total mess, and if I saw this kind of thing happening from a particular researcher in psychology, I wouldn't feel comfortable trusting anything that was published with his name attached to that work. So what happened to Brian Wanzing? Well, it doesn't seem like he got fired, but he did choose to retire the following year, which by this point is 2019. But according to Retraction Watch, Brian is back. Just last year, he published two more papers. One of them was in a journal called Curious, and the other one in the International Journal of Community Medicine and Public Health. Both the papers appear to use data that is over a decade old, and his only co-author on the paper is Audrey Wanzink, who apparently is a high school student and pretty obviously his daughter. So don't you love the academic system, a place where known fraudsters can publish garbage studies with decade-old data with their high school age children in proper journals? Love that. Great stuff. Great stuff. So what do we learn from Brian Wanzig's story? Well, Brian's story is fascinating because he's somebody who had a completely twisted view about what makes a good scientist. For him, it was all about quantity, not quality. The more your output is, the better at science you are. And while that's completely backwards to what we would want from our scientists and our academic system, it's not hard to see how he came to this conclusion. After all, he was rewarded handsomely for his output. His productivity was what made him so successful, and the only way to be that productive was to engage in dodgy practices like he did. And I know we're talking a lot about psychologists who have very poor practices, but if there's one idea from psychology that should hold true, it's the fact that people tend to repeat things that they're rewarded for. And Brian Wanzink was rewarded again and again for p-hacking and having very high output, so it's not surprising that he deemed that to be what good science is. So my question is, how do we fix this system? That's the purpose of this channel now. We're not just here to expose poor academics, but we also want to do things to try and fix the system. Exposing is only one part of the puzzle. We need to find some solutions as well. So let me know in the comments below what you think needs to be done to the academic system to disincentivize this kind of behavior. And also let me know what you make of Brian Wanzig's story in general. As per usual, I want to end this video just by saying a few notable thank yous. Firstly, to a journalist called Stephanie Lee, who comes from BuzzFeed of all places. Typically, BuzzFeed is not the institution I think of when I think of fantastic journalism, but Stephanie Lee turned out to be a fantastic investigative journalist into Brian Wanzing's case, and I used her work and her research as my primary source for making this video. I also want to thank today's sponsor again, Short Form. Thank you for sponsoring today's video and for your continued support of my channel. Remember, guys, you can use my link in the description for a five day free trial of Short Form. And finally, of course, I want to say thank you to you guys for your continued viewership and support supporting my channel. I really appreciate all the enthusiasm we've had on the channel lately. Subscribe if you like this kind of video because we're going to be exposing many more academics, but not only that, we're going to be talking about ways that we can actually fix academia. Okay, thank you guys so much for watching and I'll see you next week. Bye-bye.